kicked on with the other organizers and Brett and uh, Mark with this invitation. I'm really happy to be here. This is a very interesting meeting. There's lots of interesting discussions going on. I'm going to kind of slightly, we will talk with a slightly different flavor in that I'm going to review current research that is going on. It's very much works in progress, looking at different ways that we might crack a big problem, which is how we are to measure few vector seconds, the sub vector second electron dynamics in molecules. And by molecules, I don't just mean hydrogen. I mean really molecules that may be significant biologically or whatever. So I'm going to start by talking about the challenges of, of doing pump probe sub vector second uh, measurements in molecules. I think um, Fernando already gave us a little bit of a, a primer on that on those challenges. So I, 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 will, I will build on that. I'm then going to talk about two methods. I will briefly talk about our intracycle pump probe method, what we call HHG spectroscopy, which, which Fernando mentioned earlier. And then I'll go on to talk about new concepts in doing genuine attosecond pump, attosecond probe experiments, and how we might solve some of the technical problems. Okay, so one of the challenges is to measure and understand this very intriguing process called charge micro. The idea that if you suddenly photoionize, in particular in a valent state, in a, in, a, in a larger molecule, you will create a, 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 a localized whole state that's not an eigenstate of the cation. It will move around within the cation on rapid timescales, sub femtosecond timescales, uh, and that will result in a large amplitude charge oscillation. At least that's the theoretical prediction from 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 from, from uh, 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 then about in, in Heidelberg and others, and so this is a very intriguing idea, and it gives us something to try and measure. And some of the scientific questions associated with this idea of very large amplitude electronic motion, so basically a, an electronic hole. Um, so we're looking at the motion of the n minus one electrons from the originally n electron system, and you know, how do they move around? So how does the electronic motion couple to subsequent nuclear motion and therefore the chemical change? How does this theoretical picture stand up in real molecular systems? So I have in mind here the possibility of different complements in, in our sample that can actually make this a more complex picture. How is it modified by the molecular environment? So what happens in the condensed phase? What happens if it's interacting with a solvent? How does all this change? So we really like some methods that allow us to measure ultimately in situ, in the liquid phase, some of these processes. So we've got to throw away a lot of our current techniques of attosecond science that rely on detecting electrons and ions because they ain't going to work in the environment that we might be most interested in for these sorts of systems. So okay, let me, let me speculate and develop some arguments as to how we might uh, look at this. So okay, here's some more, some more background. I, 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 should have, I should have said this first. So we also know, just from theoretical uh, considerations, that the electronic motion will quickly couple into nuclear motion on some t sub 10 to second time scale. So this is actually a result of a calculation of the sudden ionization in glycine by my colleagues Mike Rob and Mike Beerpark. Um, similar calculations have just recently been published by them, not in glycine, these, these ones are actually just, just, just sample calculations that haven't yet been published. But sh what they show is that significant nuclear motion happening on a time scale of about five femtoseconds in that molecule. So you have to start rolling in the nuclear motion, so it's, it's, uh, appreciating that charge migration will evolve into charge transfer, which is typically associated with nuclear motion, on those sorts of few ten femtoseconds. Okay, there is, of course, some recent experimental evidence for ultra-fast charge migration. This is the experiment looking at phenylalanine by the group of, of, of Mara Lassoni and uh, in collaboration with Jason Greenfield from Belfast. And what they did is the sort of experiment that, that Fernando just mentioned, an XUV pump to do the sudden ionization, followed by an infrared laser to probe, in fact, some with the localization of the charge as, as registered in particular bond-breaking events that were measured in their, in their, in their uh, mass spectrometer. So basically, um, in this phenylalanine, they're measuring some sort of fast dynamics that are happening on about a 50 femtosecond time scale. Now, they're not really resolving the charge migration I started by talking about, and to do that, you've got to go even faster. So you need, um, ultimately, some femtosecond resolution. You need true sudden excitation of the sample. And you also need, somehow, to track the spatial as well as the temporal behavior of your, of your electrons or your holes moving around in your cation. So these are the challenges, and I'm going to speculate with some ideas as to how 
So as a second pump probe has its limitations, and, and in particular, despite what uh, Katsumi has done, where he, he can generate two powerful um, XUV pulses, in general this is very hard to do. We know the photoionization cross-sections are pretty low, so most people up to now have resorted to the scheme where you have an at a second pulse um, crossed with an infrared laser pulse, and uh, that has some advantages, as, as we heard, but we do have this problem of the infrared field being present, and also a lack of really high temporal resolution because it's an infrared field, so our pulse duration is, is typically not short enough to, to, to resolve it. So one, one possibility, at least to get um, inside the time scale of the infrared pulse, is to do some sort of intracycle technique. So in other words, use um, at a second pump probe uh, where we're actually using a, an intracycle dynamics driven by the laser field. So this is the idea of HHG spectroscopy, so let me quickly review it. So what we do in HHG spectroscopy is we use the high harmonic generation process shown here in this sort of schematic three-step way to clock and control the electron motion. So this ionization event happens near the peak of a laser field. We then get propagation of our laser, of our electron in the strong laser field, return and recombination back into the hole it, it left. So we create the hole at this moment, we probe the hole at this moment, so this is, in effect, a pump probe measurement of the evolution of the hole in the system. Um, and we've got high temporal confinement of the ionization and the recombination events, and we also have a, an ability to change the delay between them by looking at different sets of harmonic orders. We know that there's this chirp mapping that we can exploit. So that's the idea, and it's been applied in a number of experiments in, in, over the years. So basically we use the fact that the returning electron is chirped, initially it comes back with a, with a blue chirp and then it comes back with a red chirp, so the short and then long trajectories, which were first measured by Jan Mares and comes back in 2003. We used this property to look at the structural rearrangement of cations, for instance methane cation, following sudden ionization by, by, by measuring uh, in, with the short trajectories the, uh, the, the harmonic yield in the small molecule where we did an isotopic substitution to compare, for instance, protonated and deuterated methane. So that worked, and we were able to reproduce the results. And, and, and contrary to what Fernando says, the IR field does not perturb the dynamics in this case significantly. I mean, partly I think it's because the orbitals are arbitrary, <coughs> although in general I would agree that that must be a problem. Another set of experiments where um, the ionization step creates a, a superposition of states in the cation have also been reported by uh, the group at NRC and ourselves where you can study um, tentative uh, electron dynamics going on in the cation through those superpositions. So this is all um, small molecule stuff and um, we would like to extend it to bigger molecules and we would like to extend it over a larger time scale. So one possibility, as we just said, the um, what we've used up to now is short trajectories. What if we use also the long trajectories? So we can sort of double our time scale, and also by using short and long trajectories, you can, for a given harmonic order, where the dipole moments and the other, the other things will be the same, you can make two time comparisons and maybe get information out that way. So looking at this, these, um, these uh, uh, molecular HHG spectra, where essentially the dominant effect is the nuclear or decorrelation function changing in time. In other words, the nuclei are moving in the time between ionization and recombination. That produces the harmonic signal that causes them to be reduced, reduced overlap. Um, one could potentially follow that by looking at short and long trajectories. In fact, we did that recently in the laboratory for a series of model, not molecules, CO2 to H2, and uh, without going into technical details, on axis is the, um, is the short trajectory emission, off axis is the long trajectory emission. We see very strong long trajectory emission in CO2, N2, and O2. These are molecules with very little nuclear dynamics. But when we get down to D2 and H2, where there's rapid nuclear dynamics, particularly in H2, it's proton move and they move fast, um, we see no long trajectories at all. So in principle, we, we can sort of speculate we could use such a technique, but it's challenging and it's not easy, and I'm not going to go into all the, all, the, um, all the nuances of exploiting long trajectories, but they are promising, at least in principle. Another thing we would like to do is extend high harmonic generation spectroscopy to, to more molecules, in particular molecules with ionization potentials less than 10 EV. These are typical like organic molecules, biomolecule components. And so we really need to find out ways, first of all, to get them into the gas phase. So we've been doing a lot of work recently using heated samples, getting them into the gas phase in, in well-confined uh, uh, CW 
jet so that we don't have problems from, um, uh, from, from phase matching effects if we have a nice thin sample. And we can measure reproducible and, and comparable spectra in benzene and toluene and other substituted benzene. I won't, won't show you more of those right now. I'm going to rush on to some other topics. Um, and to do that, we're using um, optical parametric sources, so we're moving away from using the 800 nanometer TISAF wavelength because that limits you um, when you're looking at a low IP sample. Essentially, you want to push out at a, at a low intensity the harmonic cutoff, so you use the IP plus 3 UP scaling and scaling of UP with the wavelength squared. You, it tells you you need to go to long wavelength. So we go to long wavelength, we use a commercial OPO, we use both the signal and the idler, and with the idler there's a trick you can pull, you can hollow fiber pulse compress the idler, we managed to compress it down to sub two cycles, that's sub 10 femtoseconds now, and in doing so, one actually has the, um, the, the great benefit, but in fact the idler, idler is passively C phase lock, so you'll have a passively C phase lock short pulse, few cycle pulse, and we, we tried this twice, and on both occasions, right at the end of the day, they got the laser beam, after having characterized it with the spider, they got the laser beam into the, into the harmonic generating rig. They didn't have long to optimize it, but on the first shot, basically, in one occasion in Xenon, they got harmonics out of about 8 ATV, there's no problem. And then in another occasion, two weeks ago, they, they, they were shooting argon, and they, they, they had harmonic spectra way out to the, to the beam block in our spectrometer, so you couldn't see any further. That's at 170 EV, so it's very easy to get high photon energies doing this with that ring trying very hard. And it's high photon energies that we need for many of the future applications that I'll come back to. Okay. We discussed using um, <coughs> HHG spectroscopy, using this intracycle pump probe method. I'm going to leave that aside for a moment. We'll come back to it in, in a little while, but I'll leave it aside just for a moment because I want to talk about other ways to actually do real pump probes at a second pump, at a second probe experiments. And we've got this problem that our attosecond pulses are relatively weak. And unless we've got a really big laser, they're going to stay relatively weak. So we're going to have to find ways to, 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 to do these experiments um, uh, and, and get around those, those problems. So one approach is to say, well, actually, OK, up to now, most attosecond probe pul pulses have been carried at quite high photon energies, at around 90 EV or whatever. That was the, where the first attosecond pulses were through. Let's, let's talk about generating at much lower photon energies than the vacuum UV rather than the XUV. And for me, the vacuum UV means something like 15 EV up to about 20 or 5 or 30 EV. Now, that's a much more efficient process. Believe me, although they're supposed to be a flatter with the conversion efficiency, it doesn't really work quite like that. We really are going to be much more efficient at these lower orders by about an order of magnitude or two. And also, the photoionization cross sections for for, for a VUV pump causing sudden ionization are much higher than they are if you're carrying your, your, your pulse at 90 EV. So you really do have the advantage of higher cross-section and higher pump powers. And so this is something we've been developing in the laboratory. So the way we, we've done it is to take one of our existing beam lines, this is the one where we've been measuring up to now XUV after second pulses, and to introduce an additional gas jet. So the XUV gas jet, which is run typically in neon, has just upstream of it another gas jet, which is coming in from the other side, introducing, in this case, krypton. It's a little bit off the focus. And we can then simultaneously generate high-efficiency XUV and high-efficiency VUV in that sample. So these pulses are then co-propagating along the same axis. And in order to use or characterize them, we have to use some filters. So basically, the way we do that is we use some a filter, um, an insertable filter device whereby the beam can uh, intercept either, say, a kapton and a zirconium filter if we want to, say, that through some IR and some XUV. So that's what we did up here in order to do a, a streak measurement of the XUV posturation. Or we can move it to a zirconium indium or zirconium tin filter, so we then have some VUV and some XUV for a pump probe experiment, or to an indium cap, indium or tin and kapton, in which case we can do a streak measurement in the VUV. So that's what we've been doing over the last few months. We haven't done the pump probe measurements yet, but we have characterized our VUV and our XUV pulse generation. And in particular, filtering, well, first of all, let's look at the XUV. So this is the XUV generation well, using a zirconium filter, um, doing standard streaking and frog crab retrieval. I won't go into the technical details, both with and without 
the VUV krypton gas jet of gas present. And it makes almost no difference. We get a small broadening of the, of the XUV pulse from about 250 to 265 after seconds by introducing some, some krypton gas upstream enough to generate the VUV. At the same time, when we characterize the VUV from a, from a tin filter, that's at a central frequency of 21 EV, we get pulses of 660 after seconds. These are isolated sub second pulses. Um, we believe there's quite a high power in this, uh, this VUV pulse. We haven't actually been able to characterize that yet, but this is the ingredient we need to do pump probe measurements. We don't need to do two, these aren't two pulses of the same color, these are distinct, so they're gonna give us signatures that in principle are gonna allow us to do straightforward pump probe uh, time delay. Uh, measurements and, uh, and, and, and at the moment we're putting together the first pump probe experiments in which we're uh, introducing into the chamber where up to now we've been doing streaking a, 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 an ion top back to back with an electron BMI for the first experiments that we're about to try. So I'm not going to tell you more about those planned experiments because that would be giving too much away and we aren't actually there yet. But let me tell you instead about something else we're doing which is asking the question, well, how do we increase the amount of information we can get from the probe step, in particular, in ways that allow us to measure these more complex molecules or even condensed phase molecules. And we have funding from ERC to do this project called ASTEC, which stands for After Second Science by Transmission and Emission of X-rays. And the basic idea is that, look, we know X-ray absorption spectroscopy is an extremely powerful technique for learning about structure, and if you have a short enough pulse, about dynamics. So we already know that an XAS and XAS give, um, give structural information, and with a time resolved source, they will give time resolved structural information. Likewise, we know already after second measurements are being made by transient absorption spectroscopy, so it's a question of applying these techniques um, with the right kind of light sources and uh, then you have the possibility to measure both in gas phase but also in condensed phase. You're not going to be stopped by the fact that you have a, um, a, 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 a solid state target um, because you don't need to detect electrons, you're just detecting photons. Of course, anyone who knows about the soft x-ray will say, but hold on, the photons don't go through in the soft x-ray region anything much. Well, that's true, unless you make it very thin. So part of the challenge is to make sub-micron thickness targets, both liquid and solid targets, and that's something we're working on. I don't want to say too much about it. Another method, which goes back to the intracycle pump probe, is X-ray initiated high harmonic generation. We're doing experiments on that at the moment, and we also have some promising theoretical results I'd like to show you. I'll tell you a little bit about that as we go. It's a way of getting around the problem of the strong infrared field. You can lower the infrared field because you no longer require, require it to do ionization, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Okay, well, first of all, we know for, there's, a, a, there's a whole wealth of information about how to use um, X-ray spectroscopy near an absorption edge to get structural dynamics. So this is a, a typical uh, example of how XAS and Zanes work through the multiple scattering or single scattering from neighboring atoms and give you information of nearest neighbor distances and electronic states in the vicinity of a particular atom. And if we can do such things with HHG tools, um, then potentially we can get sub femtosecond time resolution for these structural measurements. Um, we know that in, at a second pulse in that beyond a KV have been generated. We know also that the, that the pulses are relatively weak, but certain, certainly at a few hundred EV uh, limit, we think we can have enough photons to do such measurements. The absorption edges in metals and the carbon K edge are in that sort of lower um, photon energy range, 280 down um, uh, EV. Um, and also, I would argue HHG is actually very suitable uh, for X-ray absorption because at least if it's done with a, an isolated after second pulse, it gives you a super continuum, it's more or less structureless, and that's, the, in, that's what you need to do uh, transient absorption measurements of, of absorption structures near edges. So just to convince you there's lots of information there, here is the absorption um, uh, measurements of the, X, uh, of the carbon K edge in different structures of carbon in diamond, benzene, cyclohexane, graph graphite, and also I think solid uh, benzene. And you can see that over the 280 EV to about 320 EV, around that edge, you've got very, very different um, uh, photo absorption cross-sections for the different structures. 
So in principle, you can follow changes of structure by studying carefully uh, the vicinity of an absorption edge. But also, if you look below an absorption edge, you might learn something very interesting in the atoscent division. Imagine we have two pulses. Maybe the, one of our VU <coughs> pulses, followed by another pulse that's tuned a few tens of EV below the absorption edge. If the first pulse ionizes a hole in one of the inner valence states, these are the, these are the states that typically give charge migration or frustrated, frustrated ocean decay, then that opens up a, an optical transition from the 1S state of carbon, say, into that hole. So suddenly, you will get photo absorption below the edge where there was none before against the dark, dark background, and yet you can follow that, um, you can, by measuring the time dependence of that signature, <coughs> you can measure the instantaneous whole survival probability, and you can also, choosing your edge, locate where the hole is within a molecular structure by looking at the <coughs> absorption um, uh, occurs in time for a particular absorption edge. And we know that there are edges in silicon, copper, bromine, etc., all in the 100 to 250 EV, as well as the carbon cage. So that's the goal that we're working towards. We've just finished building uh, a new beamline that allows us to do that. This is the beamline with two separated parts, so it has to be actively stabilized to get um, 100 at a second or so temporal resolution. And uh, it's actually only been finally working after being built over the last four months. It's finally working about two weeks ago, and we're getting our first signatures of, uh, in, in this case, X-ray initiated HHG, where we generate X -ray, uh, high harmonics in one gas jet and then um, use those for ionization in the second gas jet to generate harmonics. I'll say a bit, a bit about that in the next section. So that's working, and that's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about this idea, going back to our intracycle measurement method, where we are going to initiate the hole using an XUV photon from an isolated at the second pulse generation upstream. And then a weaker infrared field is used just simply to return the electron and cause the recombination. So you can drop the infrared intensity, particularly if you're using longer wavelengths, and return your electron with some kind of efficiency. So I want to tell you about what you might learn, at least based upon some theory that we recently did. So this is a paper for, that just published by Jonathan Levenberg, Misha Rivenoff, and uh, Vitaly Adelbrook and myself, in which we've looked at some calculation, uh, calculation of, of how we can measure, by looking at the high harmonic generation signature, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the, the survival probability of a hole. So essentially the, the concept is very easy. An XUV pulse comes in, ionizes from some inner valence or inner core state, an electron, which is then launched into the infrared field and returned, and when it's returned, it can complete the HHC cycle by recombining into the hole that's left with the emission of a photon, but of course, this is happening in the presence of very fast electronic processes like Andre decay, which may fill that hole. And if they do fill that hole, um, then we lose the harmonic signature. So the dipole associated with the harmonic generation depends upon the survival probability of that hole, A of tor. Um, so it sort of depends in, a, in, a, in, a, in an SFA kind of uh, picture uh, in the following way. So this is an ample quantum part of that amplitude picture. And thus, if you measure the harmonic spectrum, which is essentially the, the square of the Fourier transform of this, you can, in principle, retrieve the survival probability of the hole. Now, um, to take that a bit further, Jonathan has played around with how to launch the uh, photoelectron that does the probing, and he's played around with launching that photoelectron at different times within the infrared cycle, and by doing that, he can arrange to have the cutoff harmonic emitted at different delay times, from about 0.4 of an optical cycle all the way up to nearly 0.9 of an optical cycle. So you get a large range of times for your cutoff harmonic to be emitted uh, best by controlling the, the phase. And so basically, the proposal is to measure the harmonic intensity near the cutoff as a function of that phase and phi to allow us to measure the variation of tor and then to probe essentially what the A of tor is, is doing. And, and, and here's an explicit set of predictions based upon some calculations for three cases krypton, um, deuterodyne, and propanol. So in the case of krypton, it's the same. In a, it's the same OJ decay that was measured in the original um, um, uh, work of, 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 of out-of-second streaking, 
uh, where basically it has a lifetime of about seven femtoseconds. It's an exponential decay. There's nothing interesting in terms of the, the, the time dependence. It just sort of drops down and decays exponentially. Uh, but by measuring 1300 nanometers and 2700 nanometers, you can pick up portions of that decay with quite high fidelity according to the calculations. Similarly, uh, making the same measurements with the same uh, laser field uh, um, uh, wavelengths uh, in the case of butadiene allows you to retrieve this non-exponential whole decay. Now, we'll come back to why that's non-exponential decay in a moment, uh, but you see again, the retrieval looks good. So that's the proposed method, and I think it's exciting. It may work, but it's certainly telling us that there are, there are more than one way to measure what might be going on in these more complicated molecules. Well, here's another idea based upon free electron lasers. So we know free electron lasers are remarkable machines for giving us very high intensity x-rays and potentially for making time resolved measurements. But of course, they've had a bad press in some quarters. The, the, the laser pulse has got a wrong temporal kind of shape or there's a lot of jitter. And as, as Marcus and, 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 and Artem explained, by time sorting, you can actually retrieve your x-ray pump uh, sorry, X-ray probe laser pump delay very accurately to, to better than 15 femtoseconds now. So in fact, I think the game's on for making high time resolution measurements with, with X-rays. But I would suggest the best way to do this is X-ray pump, X-ray probe. So you're no longer worrying at all about your jitter with your laser. You're really just locking two pulses that are generated from the same electron bunch together, either by doing a split and delay, as Artem, I think, talks about in, in flash, or by using another technique that I'll talk about just a moment. But LCLS, even in the very early days, it was found that if you operate the, uh, the electron accelerator with a very low bunch charge, about 20 pico you can actually get parameters that are consistent with a few femtosecond pulse. Now, exactly whether it's two femtoseconds or four femtoseconds is not currently known, but it's certainly known. And you can use that technique in a, in a very smart method that was pioneered by, uh, by, by, the, by the machine guys there and working with Ryan Coffey, uh, which involves the insertion of an emitted spoiler, a V-shaped slotted spoiler, in one of the uh, chicanes up, upstream, I think it's in Munch <coughs> Professor 2, I believe. Um, and basically, what that does, without going into the, the, the electron uh, uh, accelerated physics, is generates two pulses of electrons that can laze, um, which are separated in time by a small and variable amount, and you vary the amount they're separated just by moving physically the separation between your two uh, emittance uh, spoiling, uh, your, two, your two slots. So basically the emitted spoiler lives in this dispersed region of the leakage chicane, so there's energy dispersion across there, and uh, you can vary the distance between them in order to sample different bits of the electron bunch energy, and so when you recompress into the time domain, you change the duration between those two bunches. And they both then laze in the undulator. So a few years ago now, we did some measurements in oxygen. So this was the, this was the run over, over Thanksgiving 2011. I think Marcus was there. No? No, you went home. <laughs> You've got wise man. <laughs> you know, it was a tough run. We didn't know it would work. But actually, I think now we're convinced it worked. I mean, the, the concept was to excite with the first pulse, or at least with the first photons, from the um, inner, inner shell state of oxygen into the pi star resonance, then to look at what happens next by, by using a second delay X-ray pulse. And in fact, what we think is going on is essentially we have OJ relaxation back into this core state. It happens on a relatively fast few femtosecond time scale. Uh, that projects our uh, molecular cation into excited states upon which dynamics occurs prior to the absorption of a second photon. And there are certain resonances that one would expect to pick up. Now, without going into the, the, the nuts and bolts of the data, because I really am running out of time, um, I'm going to simply show you a set of data. So that the signature we look at in this case, is we actually also look at uh, electron spectra, but I'll concentrate only on the uh, ion VMI images. So this is to do with the angle and kinetic energy release of the oxygen atoms in the O double plus and the O triple plus ion state. And we see a different delays corresponding to different spoiler positions uh, for different photon energies. I won't go into how we know which photon energies we're looking at. 
do with measuring carefully the bunch charge and pulse energies um, in order to uh, uh, deduce those things from the peak current matters as well. But this is all correlated stuff, and I, I don't think it's time to talk about that. But essentially what you see at a given delay, um, so rather at a given photon energy, you can see there are some subtle changes in the kinetic energy release pattern associated with resonances coming in and out of that uh, spectral region as a function of delay time from about zero to 20 femtoseconds. And this is beginning to match modeling that's being done by Nina Roringer among others to give us a, an insight into which potential energy surfaces are dominating that, um, that, that, that dynamics. Now, I, I'm not going to uh, tell you the whole story yet because we're still, we're still trying to understand the final details of this. But I think we're pretty convinced that we are seeing high time resolution pump probe with an X-ray pump and an X-ray probe. And so that led to a speculation which is, um, is, is currently being uh, uh, developed into an experiment, perhaps eventually it will happen, in which we are actually interested in using this X-ray pump, X-ray probe to measure electron dynamics as opposed to nuclear dynamics. And in this case, we want to look at one of our favorite systems, Glyce, which we can do calculations on, or rather Bridget Cooper and Vitaly Haberbuck can do calculations on. And if you in a valence ionize this, uh, there's a state uh, in the cation, about 20 electron volts, called the 10A prime state, which has character of a one-hole excitation, but also coupled to a two-hole one-particle excitation, which is essentially not accessible to any photon coupling, so it's, it's like a dark state in a sense. And your, survival, your whole survival probability <coughs> is modulated then by the oscillations driven by electron correlations between those two degenerate states, or near-degenerate states. And in fact, when you do the calculation, you see that survival probability of that hole um, in, in, in glycine is, is, is happening with an oscillation period of about 15 femtoseconds. So with a few femtosecond time resolution, in principle, you should be able to pick that up with a free electron laser uh, running either with a split and delay mode or in, a, in an emittance spoiler mode with these two pulses. And so basically going back to the idea of, of using the fact that you can open up a hole uh, using the first pulse or photons, uh, so this is the, the same energy photons being applied twice. So we're tuning, the idea is to tune the machine just below the carbon K edge. It's a little bit in the airy zone where obviously it doesn't like to run, but in principle it's known to run there. Um, you can then ionize with pulses of around 275 electron volt energy. You can ionize, just valence ionize, these valence, uh, inner valence and valence states. They'll all be generated, but the ones you're interested in are the ones that lead to absorption of the delayed probe, which is resonant with the 1S state of the valence state of interest. Now, of course, we all know that there's energy fluctuations and other such things, so you have to sort this data here. <coughs> but the signature actually is an absorption in this case, but doing absorption measurements with LCLS is just proved challenging. Um, it's actually to look at the OJ spectrum, because there are characteristic OJ electrons associated with the refilling of this hole you've made after absorption, which, will give, which are well separated from any of the photo electrons that have been produced by direct ionization. And I think I'm going to stop there. So those are some ideas we're kicking around. Of course, the challenge is still very large, trying to measure um, attosecond dynamics in real molecules. And, and, and going away from the toy systems that we've been confined to at the moment is going to be tough, and it's not going to happen tomorrow. It's going to be a, a long project. So just to recap the, the various ideas I've thrown out for discussion, with the intracycle pump probe, HHG spectroscopy, well, that may be suitable for electronic dynamics in atoms and small molecules if combined with X-ray initiated methods, because at least with the X-ray initiated methods, you can turn down the infrared intensity, so causing less uh, distortion. But I think in the end, you need real at a second pump, real at a second probe methods, and so what looks promising is our ability to make VUV sub femtosecond pulses. They look viable. <coughs> our ability um, maybe to uh, use time resolved absorption as a way to get much more information out of our molecule, not just in gas phase systems, but ultimately in condensed phase systems. So you've got real space time information about your electronic state evolution. And then finally, the possibility to use X ray pump probe from free electron lasers, where you don't have any restrictions in terms of the number of photons. We've already seen how you can actually. Uh, excite multiple electrons if you use a high intensity, so you can, in principle, uh, make some measurements there. So let me just 
to make my acknowledgements, uh, funding from the DPSRC and the ERC, and the BSL, the people who've worked on different components of what I've talked about, the theory of charge uh, migration and charge transfer. Uh, in physics, we have the Bridget Cooper and Vitaly Averbuck, and in our quantum chemistry um, team, Mike Rob, Mike Beer Park, and various students and postdocs. Um, the HHG, uh, XIHHG in transient absorption, the theory is, is by Misha and uh, Jonathan Nuremberg, and the experiments by Tom Siegel and Zolf Devecki, and then the VUVXUV pump probe uh, is being done by Toby Bitting, uh, with John Tish leading that team. And I think I'm going to have to stop thinking about that. Sort of oh, yeah, don't, I'm sorry, let me just thank <laughs> Ryan Coffey and James Cryant at LCLS and LBNL, respectively, for being over to the opportunity to work on their tools. Thank you. UV pulse photon. No, you said you. Sorry, I'm, if you go to the slide, it, it looked like you had a pulse that opened up a hole in the inner shell and then you generated a harmonic. Uh, no, I, I, I don't think it needs to be. I mean, it's just it's just got to throw an electron up into the continuum to start right. the um, the three step process that's uh, uh, associated with high harmonic generation. Um, so it doesn't have to be even resonant. In this case, it doesn't have to be resonant with it. The difference between this and normal um, HHG spectroscopy is normally you only can ionize the valence electron, the, typically the other valence electron. Right. So you're confined to having a hole only in the valence state. In principle, if you have a big enough photon in the Krypton experiment, it have to be about 93 electron volts, then you can take a hole out from here and, and launch it just into, just below, just above the ionization threshold with a few electron volts so it doesn't go away and can't be returned, and then, and then you can do the experiment. But I mean, this is just spontaneous emission into the, the hole in the, the initial state, the, the lower left diagram. This one is, yes. well, I, I guess you could, no, I mean, I, I, I guess, I.